Submarine, a weapon designed for massive striking power and stealthy operation. For years, the best defense against submarines was to listen for their approach. So imagine their surprise when the world's navies realized a strange mechanical sound they heard looked like it was actually made by a species of whale. Tracking and recording these whale songs has revealed even more surprises for scientists, whale watchers, and whale hunters. Now the quest has begun to discover the truth about the mystery of the minkies. Acoustic researcher Jason Gadamke came to Australia's Great Barrier Reef to try and find the source of a strange sound called the A-Train. The US Navy sent us down here in our first year in 1997 to try to get a positive link between the A-Train and the Minky Well. During the Cold War, the superpowers played a deadly game of hide-and-seek with one of the most powerful and destructive machines ever built. The nuclear submarine. Both sides used every technological tactic possible to discover the whereabouts of these formidable weapons. In this nuclear blind man's bluff, acoustic navigation and detection were crucial. Unable to see underwater, the submariners recorded and identified the sounds of the ocean. They had to learn the difference between countless harmless animals and the enemy. And that's what brought Jason Gadamke from the University of California Santa Cruz to the Great Barrier Reef. There's, uh, there have been a, a number of, of sounds recorded by the Navy uh, since the 50s or 60s or so that they've never been able to identify. Uh, one in particular is called the A-Train. Uh, the US Navy has recorded it for 20, 30 years or so in the Atlantic Ocean. It's a very mechanical sound, and for years, people weren't sure where it came from. Some experts thought minky whales might be responsible. Minkies are the smallest and most plentiful of the baleen whales, but they're still a mystery to science and a target for whaling. Even though commercial and scientific whalers have hunted minkies for decades, we still don't know much about their lives or even their true numbers. And so there have been public protests over how many minke whales are caught. Norwegian and Japanese whalers take between 800 and 1100 minke each year. <laughs> While whale watching has brought more endangered species to popular attention, minkies have had a lower profile. That is, until recently. I was just starting graduate school, and my advisor told me about an opportunity down on the Great Barrier Reef where minke whales actually seek out and maintain really long contacts with boats. The Undersea Explorer offers a unique experience for whale watchers. On board, business, science, and the adventure-hungry public form a vibrant partnership. Each tour funds a place for onboard research. This is the platform for the Minky Whale Project. And the passengers provide a constant pool of volunteers. Having tourists on board the vessel is actually a great help. Uh, most of the people are very interested in what's going on, so you have an endless supply of assistance. People want to help out with the work. Um, and it's, uh, it's really a treat. For a few months every winter, a population of minkies gathers by the Great Barrier Reef. I was told that the minkies will seek out boats and that they will circle around boats for hours. I was told that over and over again, but it really did not settle in until I was down here and could witness it. And when I did, my jaw just dropped. It is incredible. 
and there is nothing else like it anywhere else in the world. For Jason, being in the water close to the minkies is an awesome experience. They might be one of the smallest whales in the ocean, but at more than seven meters long and five to six metric tons in weight, they're still big animals. These fast and agile swimmers are smaller than other minkies, so they're possibly a dwarf species. Where they go when they're not visiting the Great Barrier Reef is still a mystery. But one thing we do know about the dwarf minkies is that they are curious and very noisy. Supported by the National Geographic Society and the US Navy, Jason has been listening to the remarkable repertoire of minke sounds. He uses an array of five underwater microphones called hydrophones that record the sounds onto tape and computer. That animal is moving Jason records his sightings so he can match them up with each sound later on. and spectrograms help him visualize the sound and analyze the whale noises. Surprisingly, the whales actually seem to be interested in the hydrophones and the array that we put out. We see very, very often the whales actually approaching the hydrophones within a meter or so. So far, Jason hasn't heard the mysterious A-train, but his recordings have proved the Great Barrier Reef minkies do make their own unique sounds. And that's solved another mystery. The sounds we've been recording are actually very different from the sounds that were recorded back in the 1970s from minke whales. We've been able to link the minke to a sound that's actually been recorded off the coast of Australia for the last 15 years. The sound that we've recorded, which has sort of taken the name the Star Wars sound, mainly because the very first time that I ever heard that sound, I wrote down in my logbook Star Wars, because I'd never heard anything like that. I have a lot of, of ideas as to the possibilities that it's other animals that are trying to mimic this sound, that maybe it's younger animals that are trying to produce this adult vocalization. And you can hear some of them here. That's sound. They produce it anywhere from every 30 seconds over and over and over again to every four minutes or so. I've actually sent the sound to a number of marine mammal acoustics experts, and if, at least a few of them have actually sent it back to me saying that First of all, they didn't believe it came from a minke well, and at least one of them has said they didn't believe it came from anything biological. Uh, they told me to check and see if the Australian Navy was running operations in the area. Recording the minke sounds is a scientific challenge for Jason, but hearing them in the water is physically and emotionally exhilarating. Getting in the water with the wells is just an incredibly unique experience. When I can get in the water and hear the sounds, and then when a whale actually passes beneath you and is producing sounds, it's just an amazing experience. You can actually feel the sounds vibrating in your chest and your feet uh, throughout your whole body. What are these strange and powerful sounds for? Jason Gadamke's acoustic research suggests the minke sounds may be a reproductive call or song, with whales calling to attract possible mates or fend off competitors. The minkes may also use the sounds to navigate underwater, listening for echoes off islands or the walls of canyons. But how they make and use these sounds is still a mystery. We know how dolphins produce their sounds for echolocation, but minkies have a completely different anatomy. One person who studied both the body and behaviour of minkies is Museum of Tropical Queensland biologist Dr Peter Arnold. This massive skull is particularly unfamiliar looking. 
the nose has moved to the top of the head. And in fact, from here, goes upwards to the two nostrils like our own. The eye is deep down on the side of the animal, surprisingly mobile, and they can move independently. And the ear, which is only a tiny pinhole on the side of the animal, leads to the ear bones deep at the base of the skull. There are no teeth in the monkey's enormous jaws. Instead, plates of baleen hang from the roof of the mouth. These are the baleen plates of the minke whale. Baleen, sometimes called whalebone, but it's actually a horny texture like our, our fingernails. This is the part of the whale that filters out the water. Minke whales are gulpers. They take in massive amount of water and the food. As they close the jaw, the water is forced out between these plates, but the food is trapped on the inside in these fine filtering networks and swallowed. The great whale's precious baleen was one reason the larger species, like the southern right whale, were hunted to the brink of extinction. Only a century ago, baleen was in demand wherever a flexible, springy material was needed, in corsets, fishing rods, and even policemen's clubs. Before plastics, the baleen from just one whale would pay for an entire expedition. Baleen and whale oil made whales extremely valuable, but they had to be caught and killed first. The age of mechanization helped the whaling industry speed up that process. They could catch more whales and more species. The invention of the explosive harpoon and floating factory ships made large-scale whaling a possibility. With their new industrial efficiency, whalers could process even blue whales, the largest living creatures on Earth, in a matter of hours. Fleets of whale catchers now hunted on the high seas. When whale numbers declined in the north, whaling nations turned south to the pristine Antarctic whale stocks. After World War II, whale meat replaced whale oil as a desirable commodity. It had been part of the Japanese diet for some time, but with American support, it became a crucial source of protein as the nation rebuilt itself in the post-war period. However, regulation of Antarctic whaling proved ineffective, just as it had in the Northern Hemisphere. By the 1970s, the populations of all large whale species had collapsed and the vast whaling industry fell into decline. But it didn't die altogether, and whalers turned their attention to the smaller minke whales. Today, minkies are hunted for their meat. But conservationists and whaling nations argue over how many minkies should be taken. Total population estimates vary widely from a million to just half that number. Even saying exactly what is a minke whale isn't that simple. Up until fairly recently, most people thought there was really only one type of minke whale. Uh, there was one in the Northern Hemisphere that's been hunted for centuries. And there was a logical progression that any small whale, including the one found in the Antarctic, was also called a minke whale, even though the whalers themselves recognized it didn't look quite the same. According to Peter Arnold, there are two distinct species of minke whale with the dwarf minkies seen on the Great Barrier Reef forming a separate subspecies. Adult dwarf minkies are almost two metres shorter and have different markings and colouring to the northern and Antarctic minkies. Although humans have hunted minkies for thousands of years, it's only since the 1980s that scientists have recognised the three types of minke whale. One of the, the practical implications of our knowledge now that there are at least three different types of minke whales is the fact that the talk about setting quotas for the minke whale, as if there's just one, uh, is, is quite erroneous. The dwarf, for instance, it was only described in the mid-1980s. We have no population estimates for it at all. And therefore, if we're setting a quota for hunting, it would have to be zero. 
Peter Arnold and James Cook University marine biologist Dr. Alistair Bertels developed a special interest in the dwarf minke in the early 1990s. From the northern part of the Great Barrier Reef, dive boats reported regular sightings of dwarf minkies, mainly during the winter months of June and July. The minkies were approaching the boats. That wasn't so unusual for these curious animals. But what was unusual were reports that they were staying around for hours at a time and investigating swimmers. Such behaviour was virtually unheard of. But Alistair and Peter were worried that human contact might be stressing the whales. There were a growing number of reports of divers harassing the whales, swimming towards them, even touching them, and of whales being frightened away. So we were very concerned that the impacts on the whales might not be sustainable ones. So we were interested in finding out more about the nature of the impacts so that we could help the industry to move to a more ecologically sustainable approach. So the operators of Undersea Explorer invited Peter, Alistair, Jason and his university advisor Dan Costa to become part of a floating research group. Their goal was to find out whether whale watching in the water could continue without harming or stressing the dwarf minkies. It required management and there were no guidelines in place and so we went up there to find out about those interactions so that we could develop guidelines. What's different about this project? Well, one of the things is that we're looking at living animals. A lot of the previous work has been done uh, from whaling carcasses salvaged from the, the whaling boats. Very little has been done to study living minke whales, and most of that has been in the northern hemisphere. The Great Barrier Reef research would be the first on minkies in this part of the world, and it would be the first time anyone had scientifically studied minke whales underwater. The researchers decided that the whale's behaviour should shape the encounter, and not vice versa. So when they sight the minkies, they halt the engines and set the boat adrift. Anyone getting into the water to meet the whales must cling to a rope trailed from the boat. There, I think there's tremendous value in hanging onto the rope. One, from my perspective, because it's easier just to hang onto the rope. And two, we become very predictable. We're not going to, you know, go after them or anything like that. We just become a very predictable known entity that they can be curious about. I think the, the ropes are a great idea. Hanging onto a rope in open water with venomous sea snakes and hungry sharks around can be scary, but the rewards seem to outweigh the risks. The rope makes each swimmer's position predictable and the whale's confidence grows with every pass. Just how long and how close the encounter is going to be is left entirely to the whale. These guidelines, proposed by Alistair Bertels and Peter Arnold, now form a code of practice for in-water whale watching on the Great Barrier Reef. But that was just the start. As they watched the curious minkies, the researchers wanted to know how many dwarf minkies visit this area, how often do they come, and how do they relate to each other. To find out, they needed detailed observations of every whale they saw. To achieve their ambitious plan, Peter and Alistair decided to include almost everybody on the boat in the team, both researchers and passengers. Because you're spotting from the upper deck, your observations underwater will be really important. Uh, we're only one or two pairs of eyes on the ropes, you are going to be another ten pairs of eyes on the ropes. Each researcher focuses on their specialist area, but then they combine what they learn about the dwarf minkies. The collaboration that we have between Alistair, Peter and myself is uh, very unique. We each have very different roles. Alistair spends his time in the water uh, identifying animals and uh, describing their behavior. Peter spends countless hours on the top deck, uh, again identifying individuals and describing behavior, while I'm generally sitting there with my headphones on, uh, monitoring their sounds and trying to link that up with animal positions and behavior. 
they soon realised it was possible to identify individual animals. The variations in their markings were as distinctive as any fingerprint. But recording these distinctions is easier said than done. Minkies glide and turn effortlessly in their natural element. For the researchers, it can be a struggle to keep up with the passing parade. complications about teasing out the identity of individuals is that the minkies are different on the left side and the right side. And as the numbers build up and you are unable to link the lefts and rights, it begins to get really complicated. And in long encounters when we've had uh, upwards of 20 animals, it can become really bewildering. To counter the confusion, Peter makes a duplicate set of observations from the boat the number of whales and the timing and direction of each pass. Jason records the whale sounds, but his hydrophones also help locate the minkies as they pass by. If a whale is within 50 or so metres of the array, we can get really, really accurate locations, uh, probably within a few metres or so. Ultimately, we want to be able to link up all these sounds with the different behaviours that we see um, and the different situations that we encounter. As they make their observations, the scientists and tourists develop strong feelings about their meetings with the minkies. I'll never forget those first encounters with the minkies. Out of the blue, a figure would emerge, just a dull shape to start with, with the white patch glowing. And then as the whale's confidence grew, they came closer and closer. And then sometimes you could actually see the eye swiveling to look at you. And that made it a really extraordinary experience to be in the water, interacting with a wild animal. superbly designed from their sharp pointed nose along their sleek body. They are hydrodynamically magnificent. They glide towards you and can stop right alongside and look at you. They shine. There's a, a sheen to their grey metallic colour and the sunlight reflects off them. They are exquisitely beautiful. Absolutely gorgeous. And when they were swimming underneath, you could see the texture of their skin. It was shining and sparkling, and it would um, reflect in the water. It was beautiful. Oh, it's the biggest animal I've had near me. Like, it's just really strange. What I got was a omnifluorescent uh, metallic glow off the side, and as they're constantly turning around in the water in front of you, it gives off this brilliant reflection of light. It'll just blow your mind. At the end of the day, though, Alistair and Peter must begin the complicated task of pulling all the data together in an attempt to identify individual minkies. They check their observations against daily video recordings of the encounters. Back in the studio, this methodical process eventually creates a unique, identical picture of each whale. And then there's three dots in the accelerator, and you can see the spot on here. And then this is just like it's painted on up there. On the top From the distinguishing top. marks, the scientists can give each whale an identity and a nickname. And you can see the, uh, the old puckered scar that I uh, gave her her name right. from. Pop, yeah, yeah. There. And then there's a, a clear scar Hello. underneath that. Right. 
Early in the study, the team identified a number of whales they would see repeatedly over the weeks and years. These animals would reveal secrets and dangers of minke life to the scientists. They would also become familiar faces. Wiggly Nape Streak took her name from the distinctive pattern behind her head. Cockatoo was the most interactive of the group, passing by 29 times in one encounter. She often rolled over to show her sex. She was also very interested in the hydrophone and took the opportunity to make her minky sounds. This was also Alistair's first encounter with the whale he called Scratch. I gave him his name because he had two parallel scratches on his back that were very obvious. And the white lip just on the, the right hand side of, uh, of his mouth. And he also had a, a good fringe of barnacles on his tail. Named for the oval scar on her side, old Pucker kept her distance most of the time, but did make occasional passes. And it was also clear that these animals were not stressed in any way. They were there under their own volition. Some stayed for a little while and then disappeared. Others stayed with us for almost the whole encounter. As the boat drifted for several kilometers, some of those encounters lasted for two hours or more. This meant the whales were actively maintaining contact with the boat and swimmers. There's no question they're, they're interested in what's going on down there. You know, the minute you guys put out the lines, they're swimming back and forth. I'm sure you can see from the top, they turn around looking at us, you know. Uh, they can definitely go anywhere they want. There's no reason for else for them to be here. They don't just stay and, and move in one direction all the time. They're constantly turning over on their bellies, sometimes going up for air, and they always pick these points almost right in front of you to do so. And it, I don't know whether it's a form of showing off or whether it's uh, just being playful or what, but um, it's beautiful. Even though the whales can come and go as they please, the researchers still worry that the cumulative effect of all this contact may stress or overexcite the minkies. One day, over 25 dwarf minkies accompany the undersea explorer as it drifts over 16 kilometers in five hours. They include four whales from an earlier meeting. The inquisitive cockatoo is first on the scene. This time, she decides to put on more of a show. It was very interesting when she came back that second time because her behavior was very interactive indeed. And she was straight in close to the swimmers on the line, uh, interacting with the microphone, interacting with the swimmers, and coming in much, much closer than she had at the first encounter when we met her. Unlike dolphins and other toothed whales, the Great Barrier Reef minkies don't seem to form tight social groups. The cast of characters at each meeting is an ever-changing one. Thirteen days after her initial encounter, old Pucker appears again with 18 other whales, including Scratch. This time, old Pucker overcomes her shyness and approaches the divers repeatedly showing her belly to reveal her sex. On many of her passes, she swims close down the line, examining the people in the water and allowing them a very close look at her scar. 
In whales, as in humans, a lifetime of experience is bound to leave a few scars. And every scar tells a story. Scars like this are probably from attacks by killer or false killer whales that live in the tropical oceans. But being one of the smallest whales, dwarf minkies are also prey to large sharks, like tiger sharks. Tails are often heavily scarred, being the obvious target of the predator as the whale attempts to escape. A particular scar seen on many of these whales comes from an aggressor against which they're completely defenseless. One whale that's been a victim of such an attack is Scratch. Between the first sighting and this one, Scratch had received this golf ball sized scar. The scar offered the scientists a clue to Scratch's movements because it comes from one of the deep ocean's most unusual predators. Sometime after the first encounter, the team believes Scratch made for deeper water. To do this, he would have had to swim through a channel between the barrier reefs, leading to the Coral Sea. But on this day, the ocean waters held an unpleasant surprise. A vicious predator with the largest teeth for body size of any living shark. Isistius, the cookie cutter shark. It would have been all over in seconds. A shark, no longer than a man's hand and forearm, had ambushed Scratch making off with a golf ball-sized chunk of skin and blubber. Twelve days later, this deep-pitted scar was still fresh and obvious. Only recently have scientists identified Isistius as the likely culprit. The tooth plate in the lower jaw can come up and a bit like an ice cream scoop. The, the lips may momentarily attach the shark to the, to the side of the animal, but it, the bites are probably over in a flash leaving these characteristic white oval scars of the cookie cutter shark. Multiple scars on many of the minkies raise the frightening prospect that out in open water they encounter piranha-like schools of these nasty little predators. But Scratch's misfortune was the researcher's bonus. This showed they could recognize individual whales and work out where they'd probably been. But another kind of wound tells a different and darker story. This minky is called Wop Scar. The distinctive scar may have been human inflicted, possibly by harpoon. Minky whaling continued after the worldwide population crash of larger whales in the 1970s. But a shift in public opinion led to a global campaign to save the whales. Finally, in 1986, a moratorium on commercial whaling came into effect. Since minkies were the only whale left in commercially exploitable numbers, this was, in effect, a ban on minky whaling. There are exceptions, however. Norway takes over 500 northern minkies each year in the North Atlantic waters. 
And every year, Japan takes hundreds of minkies with the permission of the International Whaling Commission. The commission permits whaling for scientific purposes, but the meat is then sold legally in markets. From there, it finds its way to homes and restaurants where whale meat remains a popular dish. However, genetic testing recently showed that a quarter of the meat traded as minky came from other protected species. This suggests that scientific minke whaling may provide a front for the killing of fully protected whales. Scientific whaling by Japan has added to our knowledge of Antarctic minke biology. But there are still unsolved mysteries. Where, for example, do the different minke species go to breed and carve? And how many minkies are there? Instead of one abundant species, we now know there are at least three different types of minke whale, with widely varying estimates of their numbers. That makes it difficult to assess what is a sustainable catch. And so many nations consider any kind of whaling should be banned. Many people do, however, accept that indigenous peoples are justified in taking small catches of whales. Whale hunting is a vital part of their culture and, without it, part of that culture may die. But in Kaikoura, New Zealand, local Maori have agreed to a ban on whale hunting. Instead, they have turned to whale watching and made it a profitable enterprise. Money earned from these whale tourism operations helps to revitalize and support their culture in other ways. Whale watching seems to be an increasingly sustainable alternative to whale hunting. There aren't such obvious threats to the animals, but the desire to get close to them could possibly lead to harassment. Which is why the Minky Whale Project is so significant. Over six seasons, they've recorded more than 300 hours of underwater encounters. And the study of these whales has revealed a greater variety of dwarf minky behavior than ever recorded before. The project has also given us a unique opportunity to look at living whales. The dwarf minkies we're finding have a number of unique features, but they're the closest relatives of the great whales, the blues, the finbacks, the says, these, these great oceanic wonders. They're the, also the whales that unfortunately have uh, been exploited heavily by the whaling industry. And so what we're learning about looking at the, the live minkies may give us a great understanding into the lives of these great oceanic wonders. So far, Peter and Alistair haven't identified any of the dwarf minky behavior with stress, and the whales have shown no signs of aggression towards the swimmers. They come right up and check you out. And then about, oh, about three quarters of the time I was down there, their behavior kind of changed. And they started to get a lot more rapid. They were basically dancing about, it felt like 10 feet away from you, and then it felt like six feet away from you. And they just seemed to be getting closer and closer as long as you stayed away from them. And they're very, very inquisitive. They want to check you out as much as you want to check them out and they just keep on making closer and closer passes. It was good to stay in one spot because then they would come back to you. You wouldn't want to go after them because you wouldn't be able to find them anyway. <laughs> with each encounter with the swimmers, the minkies seem to become more confident. But on any day, how many will turn up and which ones is anyone's guess. As the project continues, the cast of characters grows and so does the number of repeat visitors. The extensive study confirms there is a specific group of dwarf minkies returning to the same area within the northern Great Barrier Reef every year. But what happens to these whales outside the two to three months that the boats commonly sight them?
To track the minke movements, it was time to tap once more into some Cold War technology. Jason Gadamke decided to try a technique used by Navy warships to detect and locate submarines from their underwater sounds. After the first year of recordings, when we recorded the Star Wars sound, we realized that because it's so repetitious, we could actually do some remote monitoring work. And the way we've gone about this is to take Navy sonar buoys, which the Navy generally drops out of helicopters and planes to listen and see if there are submarines in the water. And we've taken these sonar buoys, modified them. They have a hydrophone, an underwater microphone on them, and a radio transmitter. And then come back to Lizard Island and listen to the sounds of the whales while we're sitting up here on land. From his vantage point on top of the island, Jason has recorded the minke whale sounds and calculated their positions. He's tracked them over an area of 50 square kilometers. The recordings so far indicate dwarf minkies are present even though they're not being seen. The remote monitoring work really gives us an added perspective that we can't get from the undersea explorer. You hear that? It's close. From Jason's recordings, it looks like the whales actively seek contact with dive boats over two to three months. But then, their curiosity seems to fade. They're still around, but appear to be less interested in the boats and swimmers. One possibility is that the minkies become more interested in breeding, and that the repeated Star Wars song forms part of a reproductive display by the males. That could explain why they return each year. And when they do, they appear to recognize their old swimming companions. Over three years, the research team on the Undersea Explorer has identified over 200 individual whales. They arrive sometimes singly, at other times in groups of up to 25. And as the scientists come to know the whales, it almost seems as if the whales recognize them. I was out on the end of the line and there were whales moving around in, in the encounter. I suddenly saw this animal behaving rather strangely because it was directly below me and it was barreling straight up towards me. And as it came towards me, getting closer and closer, I saw the white lip and I thought, I know that animal from somewhere. And just as it got a few meters below me, it blew this great big cloud of bubbles and then rose out of the water only a couple of meters away in a big head rise, crashed back into the water and then sailed past me and I realized that it was Scratch. The third time I saw Scratch was just one day afterwards and I had only just gone out onto the end of the line when I suddenly saw this whale coming directly towards me head on. It started to open its mouth in a full gape and I looked straight down its throat with this fringe of baleen hanging down either side and a beautiful rusty orange throat. It was Scratch. Scratch had come back. Still not quite sure what Scratch was telling me by that behaviour, uh, but I rationalised it in terms of uh, a smile of welcome on seeing me again. An incident with old Pucker shows just how comfortable these whales have become with humans. Once old Pucker came in, she kept doing some incredibly interactive activities. I mean, she'd be cruising down the line past passengers and then hovering. About two and a quarter hours into the encounter, uh, there was a particularly extraordinary happening. Old Pucker did a head rise, that is, her snout was coming out of the water, but she did it right next to the videographer. And as she was coming back, the snout came back towards the camera and actually touched the camera. But there wasn't any great sense of panic. The, the animal just continued on. She continued to be interactive throughout the whole encounter.
Alistair and Peter are still assessing what effect, if any, these encounters might have on the dwarf minkies. But their effect on the scientists and passengers aboard the undersea explorer is powerful and emotional. And over the course of a long encounter, when people may have been in the water for many hours with a few minky whales that they've identified as individuals, they become very close to those animals. And I well remember one of our first long encounters. We'd been with a group of five whales for nearly five hours. And we had to leave them because the sun was setting and we had to sail back to the reef. And as we headed off to the reef, the whales were moving along in our wake with their backs glistening in the golden setting sun. And I looked back and there were people all over the deck of the boat staring off at the whales in the wake and some of them had tears running down their faces. And I, I did some interviews with people immediately afterwards to try and capture the experiences that they'd had. And three out of the first four people I interviewed just burst into tears as they were trying to explain to me the extraordinary strength of the feelings that they had during the course of these encounters. Thanks to the Minky Whale Project, we can now see these little whales as individuals, creatures as curious about us as we are about them. But the research also highlights the central role played by minkies in the debate over human relationships with all whales. After their moving encounters, scientists and tourists return to the safety of their homes. But just where the minkies go to is uncertain. In Antarctic waters, dwarf minkies have been caught along with southern minkie. It's possible the Great Barrier Reef population may migrate there during the summer months. If they do, and if whaling quotas were extended to include dwarf minkies, then these friendly whales could be at risk. Their increased familiarity with whale watching boats might make them easy targets for southern ocean whalers. Humanity's conflicting approaches to whales means they're pressured on all sides. In the last 10 years, Whale watching has grown to be a billion dollar industry. But uncontrolled tourist exploitation could lead to overkill of a different kind. Like other forms of whale watching, you know, swimming with whales could be considered as a viable alternative to other forms of exploitation like whaling. But that's really true only if it's done sustainably and on the whale's terms. Otherwise, these encounters should not happen. And if they are managed in a sustainable way, then they are a renewable resource, and minky whales can be uh, enjoyed by people for many years to come. Thanks to some smart Cold War technology, we'll be hearing a lot more from the mysterious minky whales. We'll be able to track their strange mechanical Star Wars song wherever they go. And perhaps one of the smallest whales in the ocean will play a very big part in determining the future of all whales, great and small.